We are about to begin the next panel, so please take your seats. Good afternoon. My name is Yasmin Koli Fordham, and I am a 2014 Aspen Security Scholar, and I'm honored and grateful for being here. I'm here to introduce the next session, Afghanistan and Pakistan, Lessons and Prospects. The long war in Afghanistan is ending, and with his presidency, so is our strained relationship with Hamid Karzai. New leadership in Kabul notwithstanding, given our imminent withdrawal and continued instability in neighboring Pakistan, is the return of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda inevitable? It will be moderated by Kim Dozier, contributing writer for The Daily Beast and CNN's global affairs analyst. Kim will hold the 2014-2015 Bradley Chair at the U.S. Army War College, Penn State Law, and Dickinson while working on a book on resiliency and clandestine operations. Her best-selling book, Breathing the Fire, Fighting to Survive and Get Back to the Fight, details a 2006 car bomb on her, on her CBS Evening News team with profits going to charities for the combat injured. And with that, the floor is yours, Kim. Thank you. Well, we have a great panel assembled. I want to thank Clark, as usual, for pulling this off. Um, we have, um, to my right, Jeff Eggers, who is the NSC's um, point man on Afghanistan and Pakistan. Ambassador Jelani, um, still fairly new to Washington, D.C., from Pakistan. Ambassador Hakimi, uh, from um, Afghanistan. And, of course, General John Allen, who was uh, the commander of ISAF and is now um, the Pentagon's, one of the Pentagon's Mideast envoys trying to sort out the problem on Israel. So I will try to resist and not ask you anything about that, but no promises. It's not a problem about Israel. <laughs> We're trying to sort out. Sorry. problem about Middle East peace. Middle East so peace. Thank need you. need to get that out very quickly. So <laughs> as you can see from the get-go, these guys aren't going to be shy correcting me. So let's set the stage. Um, Afghan forces are being tested, but are holding their own with fairly minimal U.S. support, but still with U.S. logistical and intelligence support and massive international security assistance while waiting for an election recount to pick a president. The U.S. has negotiated a bilateral security agreement. The current president, Hamid Karzai, won't sign. Though the original U.S. status forces agreement could run indefinitely, the NATO SOFA expires at the end of this year. And we have a NATO summit looming in early September where NATO countries will decide how long they hope to stay, what resources they hope to contribute to Afghanistan with no idea who might be sitting in the chair representing Afghanistan. And the results of the election hinge on a ballot recount that was briefly suspended again this week over disagreements on what constitutes a fake vote. And this recount brokered by Secretary of State John Kerry is linked to a power sharing agreement that both candidates have pledged to enter into no matter how the count goes, but one that is technically unconstitutional the way the Afghan constitution is written now. And finally, we have a drop dead deadline in early fall to pull out U.S. troops in time to meet the White House's self-declared deadline of the end of 2014 to pull out without a new SOFA. Meanwhile, in Pakistan, while there's been some warming of relations with U.S. officials, Pakistani officials have warned against a precipitous U.S. withdrawal, worried that it will trigger instability in Afghanistan that will pour over into Pakistan. So with that somewhat complex picture, let's kick off the questions and start with the vote count and the NATO summit. So Ambassador Kimi, Jeff, how's the vote count going? And what are we looking at ahead of this summit? Will you have a president by then? Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, the uh, Aspen Institute for having us here. I really enjoyed This is my third time being here. So my wife and I, we really enjoyed it. Uh, for her, it's the second time. For me, it's the third time. Uh, well, this uh, election, if I may, um, uh, this is the first time in our history 
that uh, we will have a, a political transition from one elected president to the next. So, in other words, we are learning by doing things. Um, this uh, uh, issue of recount uh, or this full auditing came because um, uh, when the uh, first round, uh, we have seven million turnout and also then the second round, eight million Afghan, which is uh, uh, a very strong signal from Afghan people how we are committed to to democratic uh, uh, system. Um, the uh, result of the second round, um, then one of the candidates, uh, he uh, uh, challenged that and uh, there was an allegation of frauds. Dr. Abdul Abdullah Abdullah. Dr. Abdullah Abdullah and then uh, uh, he, uh, he declared himself uh, as a winner and some of his supporters um, uh, wanted to have uh, uh, establish a, a parallel uh, government. But of, course, so, but of course, the other candidate, Dr. Ghani, has also accused Abdullah's campaign of election fraud throughout this process. Correct, yes. There's yes. not a lot of love lost between those right, two. Right, right. So all this uh, uh, created a, a steel mill situation where uh, our uh, uh, international allies, mainly the United States, uh, with the support from uh, Secretary Kerry initially and also uh, from UN, uh, uh, that support, uh, they, they want direct interactions from them. Uh, we, uh, we managed to, to bring both candidates together and they agreed on, on uh, some principles that how technically uh, resolve this issue of fraud because we definitely need to have a legitimate government. Uh, the outcome of this election should be a, a strong legitimate government and also uh, they have agreed on the, on the political dialogue also. So um, uh, uh, for that reason, the time frame for this full recount, which both candidates agreed is, that uh, the, uh, the, uh, our uh, election commission, with the support with, uh, from the UN and uh, uh, giving the, uh, the opportunity for all the observers, uh, international observers, that based on the uh, um, best international standards, they should do the auditing, and also it should be open to media, uh, that they should see the whole process. And uh, it started it in July uh, 17, uh, mm -hmm. with that understanding that within three weeks to four weeks time, they should, uh, they should complete the full recounting, or auditing also. And then uh, whomever will be our new president, um, we will have an inauguration ceremony, and, and this new president will, will attend the, uh, the NATO summit. So rough date of when you expect that inauguration ceremony? Well, as I said, uh, the best case scenario is to uh, July 17 started it, uh, within a month time, uh, August 17. So uh, immediately after the ceremony will follow, the uh, uh, presidential inauguration ceremony. And then first week of September is NATO summit and uh, the new president will, will lead Afghan delegation there. So you think um, that you could have, your country could have a new president in time for that NATO summit. Jeff, do you think they will have a president in time for that new NATO summit? Thanks, Kimberly, and, and we're certainly hopeful so. And let me just start by saying it's an honor to be up here with the two ambassadors, uh, Ian McBark, T. Both, and General Allen, whose uh, very strong leadership was critical in a very difficult time in Afghanistan. We're very hopeful that we will have a new president, and there's no reason why we can't at this stage. Uh, the process overall uh, was going reasonably well, uh, and at this point it's back on course after, after having gone through what was admittedly some very uh, difficult shoal waters several weeks ago. Uh, the first round of the elections, the, the electoral institutions, the Afghan security forces, the campaigns themselves, uh, appeared to be conducting uh, a much improved election after the, the 2009 process that, that many of us lived through. And then, as everyone knows, we hit a crisis in the runoff over these very serious and, and frankly, quite reasonable allegations of fraud. And then on the other side, in, in response to that, a threat to disengage from the process and, and establish a parallel government, which we obviously took very seriously because we think this political transition is so critical. So where we sit now is in the implementation of the agreement that Secretary Kerry was able to reach between the two candidates. And it's important to stress there's two sides, as the ambassador discussed, to this agreement. There's a technical side. Which, which 
amounted to moving the process into a full audit. The audit would be done in Kabul, and it would be under uh, reinforced international supervision with, with again, kind of a, a more robust set of implementation measures. Um, and more importantly, both candidates agreed to abide by the outcome of that audit. So we had brought both candidates and both camps back to the process. So that was the technical side. The, the flip side of the agreement was the political framework. And they agreed on the basic contours of a political framework towards a unity government, and as has been discussed, some amount of power sharing. It would be consistent with the Afghan constitutional, Afghanistan's presidential system. The details are still being worked out. But you need both sides of this agreement to move forward in parallel. It's not a sequential process. In order for the international community to see a credible outcome that it can continue to support, we need both sides of the agreement to be followed through in parallel. Given that the audit is proceeding, it's going to stop for a couple days during Eid in, uh, to acknowledge the, the holiday here. Uh, but once it resumes, given the resources that have been applied from the international community and within uh, the ISAF framework within Afghanistan, there's no reason why the audit can't be completed in time to have a new president uh, seated in, in the BSA sign, the NATO SOFA sign, in time for the NATO summit. That said, we're the US putting- US and the NATO SOFA sign to time Absolutely. For that said, we're putting a premium on the credibility of the process and therefore the outcome. So as, as, as is sometimes said, better to get it right than get it fast at this point, even if we accept some risk for that timeline. Uh, I, having listened to the last panel, I don't think the NATO summit's going to be at a loss of topics for discussion uh, if there's not a new Afghan president there. But at this point, uh, we're very hopeful that that could still be the case. But, but the technical agreement and the power sharing agreement does require some changes to the Afghan constitution and Ashura to carry that out. It yes. would over, over time. Uh, uh, over uh, how the, long? The, the framework stipulates a period of, of about two years under which you could go through the constitutional amendment process of Aloya Jirga. In the near term, however, it could be implemented the, the initial phases of those reforms and that unity government could be implemented through presidential decree. Yeah. I would be very cautious by using this power sharing. Uh, I, would, I would like to use, because th that was the agreement to say that uh, national unity government, and uh, still we are waiting for both candidates to come out and, and have a joint statement to detail out all the, all the things that they have agreed. Uh, so all the details, and we are waiting for them to tell us so what would, they have agreed. Would the but then principles. Mm -hmm. Uh, they agreed, as, as Jeff said, is a power uh, uh, like uh, national unity government. And the winner would be president, okay. and the loser would be, or the runner-up would be, you create they a prime form, minister position. They will form a government that they, the loser will join. Now, Ambassador Jelani, watching this, what are your concerns? And uh, if you could pick one, who would you pick? <laughs> well, uh, for that, uh, Kim, we will have to have a, a, a separate meeting. Okay. Uh, but, <laughs> but you see, the point is that I would like to, uh, uh, to say that this political transition which is taking place in Afghanistan, it is one of the most important transitions, political transitions that is taking place in our region. Uh, we had a political transition in Pakistan where one democratically elected government was replaced by another uh, democratically elected government. We had a, a recent uh, political transition in India, which is also very significant. And, and now we are witnessing a political transition, a historic transition in Afghanistan. Uh, despite the, the challenges and despite the, uh, the controversy related to ballot uh, 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 fraud, I think the um, overall situation is looking very, very positive. I, I am saying this not because as a diplomat I have to maintain a degree of optimism, but certainly there are some very positive indications which uh, we are witnessing. One positive indication is that in the context of Afghanistan, we are having a, an election for the first time where the outcome of the election uh, mandate is not predetermined. Uh, you had. Uh, a large number of uh, uh, voters which turned out despite threats from the, uh, from the Taliban and other elements. And I think that a record number of people, they participated and voted in the election process. Uh, you, uh, the, 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 both the candidates are their educated people and uh, one has reason to believe that they would feel a higher sense of responsibility because there is a greater responsibility that lies on the two candidates to uh, 
to uh, to to, main, to to ensure that the uh, that the the process does not uh, uh, go astray, um, uh, because if that is that happens, if uh, one wrong move by one candidate is going to not only uh, be devastating for Afghanistan but also Pakistan and the entire region, because there are serious consequences in that. But we certainly see these as some as positive developments. In uh, other contexts, uh, uh, I would say other positives that we have we are witnessing is that the uh, the candidates they have uh, they are educated, they have chosen their running mates very wisely in order to fill the ethnic ba uh, the the, uh, the uh, ethnic gap. And the important thing is that that when this crisis emerged a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the uh, U.S. intervention, the telephone call from President Obama, and also the subsequent uh, uh, the uh, active uh, diplomacy by Secretary Clinton, I would say that that was able to uh, bring the situation back at least for the time being, so, which is a certainly positive uh, development which is and, and seen as such by Pakistan. Now, um, one of the reasons that Ambassador Dobbins was not able to join us and had to cancel last moment is he was talking about... Um, wouldn't say who, but it seems there are going to be some high-level U.S. Vis visitors um, keeping the pressure on, uh, just as the ambassador suggests, um, or rather keeping things going. Jeff, can you enlighten us on that? Yeah. Getting on a plane anytime soon? Absolutely. And in, in Secretary Kerry's engagement, the calls from the president, um, and the president can, continues to stay engaged uh, and very interested in this uh, to include uh, today. Um, uh, getting updates on this, and, and, and uh, as you said, Ambassador Dobbins just got back from another trip. Uh, I anticipate Secretary Kerry will remain very close to this, uh, uh, notwithstanding the, the incredible amount of array of issues he's working. But I think that level of engagement demonstrates, uh, you know, the long-term intent to remain engaged in Afghanistan for the long term. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about how much investment for how long. Uh, over the last months, uh, given some of the decisions that the president had to make uh, this spring. But I think what this demonstrates is that in one form or another, the United States intends to remain engaged. Uh, in this regard, it's dip diplomatic engagement. Uh, I think, uh, at least from our perspective, very critical and important engagement at a very important time. Uh, in other ways, it will be military resources, it'll be financial assistance, but we will remain engaged and that will manifest in uh, phone calls today, trips next week, and, and so forth. So I, I have to bring it up. Is this a lesson learned from Iraq and the failure to sign a continuing SOFA there to stay engaged and use the presidential office and that influence? I will say that, that several years ago, watching the, the failed negotiation with the SOFA in Iraq, there was internally a sense that we wanted to have the BSA negotiations uh, incorporate the lessons of that experience and be well in front of it. So the strategic partnership, which was the, the foundational precursor to the bilateral security agreement, was signed uh, when President Obama went to Kabul in May of 2013, and we immediately set out on trying to conclude a bilateral security agreement. That agreement was concluded in the fall of last year in terms of the text being locked, and as everyone is well aware, uh, it, was, it was a political issue that, that, uh, that prevented President Karzai from being able to sign it, but that was it. We were ready to sign, and we, were, we wanted to be well in front of the elections and well in front of any military logistical requirements for exactly those reasons. We wanted it locked in early. Uh, we still need it. We still require it, uh, but, and we're confident we'll get it done because it is, at this point, uh, concluded, all but signatures, sitting on a shelf, ready to be signed, and both candidates have reiterated several times their commitment to sign it within days. So let's get into that conversation um, about Afghanistan's security and how much international support, how many U.S. troops might be required to keep it stable. Um, General Allen, I know that you're not getting sit reps every day as you were as Com ISAF, but you're still watching. How do you think the Afghan security forces are doing? Well, let me start, as some of my colleagues here have, by thanking Clark uh, for the invitation to come back and the Espen Institute for this really terrific uh, gathering of ideas and, uh, and scholars and people, uh, and this great panel as well. Um, you know, the Afghans have come a very long way uh, in a relatively short time. Uh, it was uh, on the basis of 
a rel relatively skeletal force just five years ago that we began to build the Afghan National Security Forces as we see them today, about 352,000. And they really didn't get into the fight uh, and leading the operations across the country technically until the spring of 13. Now they were, they were well in the lead in many places in the summer of, of 12. But they are by and large uh, strategically, strategically in the context of Afghanistan and uh, operationally and tactically leading the vast majority of the operations. And the, the ISAF force converted itself ultimately from being a general purpose force to an advisory force. So we've really seen an enormous transition in a very short time. And for this audience, can you explain what that would mean practically? Yes, for many years, uh, NATO, uh, ISAF, fought the war. Uh, the idea was to do three things. One was to push back the momentum of the Taliban, uh, which in 08 and 09 was uh, unambiguous. So to push back the Taliban, buy some time and white space to do the other two things which we sought to do, which was to build the Afghan National Security Force capacity and then to build institutional capacity to support it over time. You have to do those three things in any, any uh, counterinsurgency. So <clears throat> ISAF was organized to fight those kinds of operations for a very long time, but the campaign, and this is an important point, the campaign always envisaged that there would come the day when those roles would shift and the ISAF force would convert itself from being a general purpose conventional force to being an advisory force as the Afghans uh, moved into the lead. But it also envisaged for a long time uh, a residual force that would be geared against the Afghan need from the institutional level right down to tactical training. So the idea of a, of a long-term US military presence, more specifically a NATO presence because the, uh, the I think the long-term operation is gonna be called resolute support. Uh, that's, that has been on the books for a long time. And commanders have had different views on what the numbers ought to be and how long they ought to be there. But I think the key point is the Afghans are in the lead. Uh, their general officer leadership is pretty good. I mean, there are core commanders today leading operations in Afghanistan who could be major generals in any army. They're very good. But we still got work to do. We still have training to do. We still have a capacity to deliver. We built an army that could fight as infantry first and foremost, and it, it's gonna take a while to build the more difficult functions, which is battlefield maintenance and medical support and those kinds of things, and that's on track. Now, Ashraf Ghani was very clear uh, in the conversations we've had that the post-American drawdown and the NATO drawdown has to see a coherent transition from a security-based strategy in Afghanistan ultimately to a stability-based strategy in Afghanistan, meaning a strategy that builds institutions of governance, creates opportunities for economic development, and none of that can occur without being underwritten by a stable security strategy. And that's the reason we have to stay, and that's the reason we need ultimately to have the kinds of trainers in the right numbers for the right amount of time to underwrite that security to permit the transition from security to stability over time. Okay, you say have to stay. Now the current plan calls us calls for us mm -hmm. to have our current forces by the end of next year and then the year after that go to zero, or at least that's what we always report. Uh, Jeff, you know we're talking beforehand and you basically say the media is obsessed with the zero figure. So explain how the White House plan would do what General Allen is talking about. Of course, and happily. The the plan that's been laid out and that the president announced uh, after undergoing an internal uh, review and then a decision process this spring continues the, the transition process that General Allen uh, just walked through. And that's really what it is. It's a continuation of a security transition process. We, we have shifted the mission now, as you have said, to, to putting the Afghans into the lead and, and, and effectively ending the U.S. combat mission. But that's not the end of the mission. The NATO mission that will follow resolute support will con continue a train, advise, and assist mission to continue to undergird the development of the, the Afghan security forces. And that will start at a, a core level regional framework. And it will continue to have transitions within that, that element, where it will transition from a core level train, advise, and assist to an institutional train, advise, and level assist, and then further transition into a security assistance cooperation. That time frame has been assessed as requiring about two years, starting at the beginning of this year, so through all of 2015, 
and then institutional level in 2016, and then continued security cooperation assistance beyond that. So the zero troop figure is, is not part of the plan. At no point in that timeline does the troop number go to zero. It decreases over time as the mission changes, but the commitment and the, the engagement continues and transitions in form over time. And what you'll see is that what the Afghan security forces require increasingly is, as it shifts from, from train, advise, and assist to security assistance, is financial assistance. Because at no point in, in the foreseeable future will they be self-sustaining in a financial way. And that's one of the most important uh, forms of the long-term commitment that's been outlined in both the strategic partnership and the bilateral security group. And yet, OK, two things. In Historically, when the US draws its troop levels down, Congress does lose interest in funding the operation. How are you going to keep meeting that price tag of four to five billion dollars a year for Afghanistan security force assistance um, after we don't have, um, you know, blood, sweat, and tears invested into it physically on the ground? And the other thing is, we thought the institutions in Iraq were doing pretty well when we left. Do you trust your own evaluation of such institutions? Well, the. The, the NATO summit, as, as was discussed in the earlier panel, is going to be critical because it's not just uh, a U.S. funded. There is an international effort uh, to, to fund the, the sustainment of the Afghan security institutions. Uh, there was a commitment at the Chicago summit several years ago uh, to, to see that through this decade of transformation, and we expect to, to uh, reaffirm uh, that basic commitment, which is in an international commitment. The United States, of course, bears the burden uh, of that and will continue to work with Congress to make sure we're prepared to do so. There is the historical trend you point to where a decline in troops does tend to uh, uh, diminish the, the incentives for continued funding of these campaigns, but that's where we're going to need to continue to work with Congress. Okay, so let's get back to if we're in the middle of 2016 and the Taliban is challenging the Afghan security forces all over the place. We've had already recently a campaign in Southern Helmand. Um, I can foresee, uh, the CIA can foresee a future in which the Taliban is reasserting itself in almost all of the non-urban areas. Do you reassess or do you keep going to zero? Well, the, whether or not there's a, a reassessment is a hypothetical question I, I wouldn't want to get into. What I would say is the initial indications are good, as General Allen alluded to. Uh, the first test of the, the ANSF in, in this new mode of them leading the fight on, on their own uh, occurred in Northern Helmand early this season, where the Taliban mounted a very serious offensive in, in a place called Sangin. It's a very virulent Taliban threat that exists in area, this area. Um, and, and I'll give you two important facts, and, and General Allen can speak to this uh, certainly uh, as well. The, the core that is in this area is, is one of the cores that has not always been rated at the top of the structure, and the ISAF did not provide a significant level of combat enabler support. They provided some intel sharing and so forth, but mostly this was an Afghan-led uh, response to the Taliban offensive. And both defense and intelligence assessments that are coming in see this as having been a reasonably good success for the Afghan side that they held this back. So that's a reasonably good initial indication, that they're being tested and that they're standing up, even in this very difficult area, without a lot of international support. Uh, just a couple of comments. When my first meeting with General Kayani in Pakistan, uh, he said to me, at the end of 14, you all are going to leave Afghanistan. Uh, just as it happened at the end of the Soviet war, the Afghan security forces will stumble along, unresourced for some number of years, fracture along tribal and ethnic lines, and, and we're going to see the same problem again. Uh, I said that, that that's profoundly different now. It's fundamentally wrong that that assumption is going to dictate the, the direction of the United States and NATO in this. So it's, it's really important that people understand that the residual force, the economic support, the continued governmental capacity building, uh, the support by the coalition of nations, the, the 50 states that are there, that have been there for some period of time, the 28 nations of NATO and partners, all of that is going to continue very differently than it did before. And so the, the 
Taliban narrative that we're abandoning Afghanistan and we're abandoning the Afghan people is just flawed. And we have to defeat that narrative by ensuring that we're very clearly pointing to the success of the Afghan forces after so many years, that our commitment to Afghanistan is one that can be seriously reconsidered if, as you point out, at the end of two years or at the end of one year, frankly, because the, the troop drawdown is going to be pretty dramatic in the first year, that we can reevaluate this. And here's an opportunity for the new Afghan president to establish a relationship with our president and with Washington that has taken quite a beating of late. And my hope would be that the, the heads of state of both of these governments can have a reasonable conversation such that if we need more time, and that time genuinely contributes in credible ways to the sustainment of that established stability uh, strategy, that there is the space for that kind of a decision to be made. That it's just not a automatic movement to some very low number of security assistance troops at the end of two years. And, and I, I can't speak for the president, and I won't attempt to speak for Jeff and the National Security Council, but here's an opportunity for the new president to have a conversation with our president about at least keeping the door open for reevaluation as time goes on, because if we need more time, we need more time. <clears throat> and this investment that we have made in Afghanistan and the residual force that's being put in place can make the difference between this having been successful over time or having been a failed campaign. And this is where, we, this is where the war winning will occur not on the battlefield by maneuver forces from NATO, but ultimately Afghanistan being able to stand on its feet with credible institutions of government, creating economic opportunity for the people with security forces that can protect those institutions. And for some period of time after the campaign has been completed, that residual, that enduring force must be there to provide that support. So Jeff, could you see a point when you would advise the president that perhaps we should leave a counterterrorism force of anywhere from 100 to 1,000 troops to help the Afghans keep the pressure on Al-Qaeda, Haqqani, et cetera? Well, the, the, the need to maintain the ability to uh, disrupt threats to the United States, whether Al-Qaeda or the, the remnants of Al-Qaeda or the next generation of Al-Qaeda, that, that remains constant. There, there is no question that that remains the intent, that, that that capability in some form or fashion has to endure. Um, Troops obviously are often part of that, uh, but they're not, they're not uh, necessary and sufficient in and of themselves. And I think where we're focused now is on providing the ability so that you have all the options you need downstream for whatever kind of, of CT uh, requirements you may, you may need, whatever threat might emerge. And those, I would, I would focus on, on the two that have already been discussed. One, political stability. That if you don't, if you don't ensure the, the success of this political transition process and lasting political stability, you really have a much larger, larger problem, uh, and you don't even have a foundation on which you can stand and have some options. Two is the integrity of the, the Afghan security apparatus as a, as a broad-based provider of security and stability in the country. As you've seen elsewhere in Iraq and so forth, if you don't have that basic functioning security apparatus within the country, your options are greatly reduced and the scope of the problem is greatly expanded. So we continue to invest on the security of those, the, the, the integrity of those institutions, the success of the political transition strategy, and for right now, that's where our focus is, and I think that'll provide the best, uh, the best long-term approach. Ambassador Hakimi, could you see a time when your government would ask for a larger force from NATO or the U.S. to stay? Well, it's, uh our policy, I'm, I'm talking about President Karzai's policy, that we have welcomed this decision by, by U.S. And to draw down or uh, to? No, that this, this decision that's already made that uh, Jeff already described by uh, end of 2016. But uh, um, uh, this issue of uh, enablers and also a continuation of uh, uh, financing the ANSF, as General Allen said, that they are uh, capable enough to uh, to deter all these threats. Uh, I think that's important, uh, and, and uh, not only from our US allies, but from our NATO allies. And uh, that was all about uh, uh, on, on, the, on the BSA that we have discussed for one and a half year or so, that, uh, that sustain for the sustainability of ANSF, mm -hmm. uh, to, to uh, give them the financial resources and other enablers that they need to deal with this threat is important. But you could all see a future in which it's not a true zero. It's not just 100 
U.S. military officers at the embassy doing the cooperation and military assistance type work. It could be a bit more. It could include some operators. It could include some aircraft, et cetera. Well, the, the numbers right now uh, are even in excess of a couple hundred just for the security assistance mission because even if it's just a secure, if we're, if we're lucky enough to have the problem where it's just a security assistance mission, it's still a very large security assistance mission, probably the largest we'll have in the world. Um, and that requires a fair number of, of U.S. troops uh, and, and resources just to administer that program. What you need on top of that of what kind is, is as we've seen, going to be a function of, of the threat that's evolving at a pace that makes it very difficult to say what, what would be required in two years. The, the evolution that we've seen in, in Iraq and Syria in just the last six months suggests that we're operating on a time, uh, time horizon with, with, a, with a dynamic that, that makes a two-year uh, horizon very difficult to forecast. Well, I wanted to ask, um, Ambassador Jalil, the um, idea of uh, drawing down this fast, that affects your country. Um, right now, we have had, um, in the past week or so, we've had a, uh, another Pakistani official talking to a lot of members of the media, including the Daily Beast, saying that the U.S. has so little capacity and Afghanistan's forces are so tied up with their own fight that they're not providing the anvil to Pakistan's hammer as it hammers through North Waziristan and drives militants over the border into Afghanistan? Well, Kim, um, to be honest, um, to commend for me uh, as an ambassador uh, to the United States of America, to comment on the decision of the US government on the number of troops or the, uh, or the time frame uh, it would be inappropriate, plus it would be uh, highly presumption, uh, pres presumptuous of me. But the point that we were trying to make is that the, uh, the operations that we have launched in North Waziristan, I think this is one of the most significant decisions taken by the government of Pakistan in so many years. Why significant? Because there were risks involved, there were capacity issues, there were the question of the uh, civilian populations to be, uh, to be removed from Waziristan, to be brought in, into the settled places. And all these years, we have been talking about a, a hammer and anvil approach. Uh, uh, what, uh, what we are witnessing is that, when, that now that the uh, hammer is in full swing, uh, uh, we have uh, cleared Miran Shah, we have uh, uh, moved our ground forces there, we are now uh, in the process of clearing Mirali, which is the, another uh, strong base of uh, um, all these militants, the foreign militants, including the Haqqani network. And the next phase is going to be Shawal, which is the mountainous area, and also uh, with thick forests where these people they are going to, uh, uh, to go and hide themselves. Uh, the, uh, uh, what my point is that while uh, the hammer is in full swing, uh, we only hope that the end bill that we have been talking about for a long time, that would also appear one day because uh, our apprehension is that many of these elements, uh, they are on the run, obviously. They are on the run. They are, uh, some of them, they may have gone to Afghanistan, uh, the people belonging to the Haqqani networks. Uh, these are the kind of apprehensions which were part of our ongoing discussion with the U.S. side, with uh, also the Afghan side. Uh, we are having a good cooperation, but the, uh, I think some, some, something more is required to be done in order to make sure that the, uh, the successes that we are achieving in Afghanistan, in, in, in North Waziristan, uh, they, uh, they are conclusive. And uh, we, should, we should make every possible effort that these people, uh, they, uh, uh, they do not find any refuge anywhere. Uh, anywhere, and, uh, and the important thing is that we also need to cooperate very, very closely in order to ensure that these people, they also do not come back, uh, they do not regroup, because that would again have very, very serious consequences. Uh, we are making every possible effort, we are screening each and everybody, uh, uh, including the IDPs who are moving into the settled areas, and we, our expectation would be that the, similar, the same thing is done on the Afghan side as well, because these people, many of them, about 40 to 50,000, they have moved to, to, uh, to Afghanistan. We don't know as to who those, uh, uh, those people are. 
whether they are uh, uh, Pakistani tribals living in North Waziristan who have moved to Afghanistan, or whether those are the Afghans who were living in North Waziristan for the last many years. But the point is that, that uh, this is the stage when we need to, to, take, uh, to, to coordinate our efforts in a, in a manner that each and everybody who goes over to the other side is uh, screened and monitored. That's perhaps the most important thing from our point of view. So over to you, Ambassador Hakimi, um, where, where is the anvil? Well, the, uh, before uh, this operation that uh, uh, my colleague mentioned, uh, there was an understanding between the two, uh, uh, two sides, and there was a delegation from both sides went to Kabul and from Kabul to uh, Islamabad. Uh, there was an agreement that how we should uh, coordinate uh, these matters in the future. And uh, we were very clear in one point uh, that uh, a pursuing of uh, this policy of bad Taliban versus good Taliban, it's not going to go anywhere. And uh, as Ambassador referred to uh, Haqqani Network, uh, uh, our uh, information indicates that uh, uh, Haqqani Network, instead of coming to this side of the Duran line, uh, they have given safe passage inside Pakistan, and they are going elsewhere uh, inside Pakistan. But never, nevertheless, that if we have any intelligence, with which we still rely on our uh, NATO allies on intelligence sharing, uh, either unilaterally or uh, uh, or uh, jointly with with uh, uh, our NATO allies, we we will uh, will uh, take the lead and, and deal with this issue. So you're you're very politely both accusing each other of the other's government letting insurgents escape into the other one's country and have shelter there. Oh. Well, the principle was to, to uh, stop blaming him, okay? But uh, uh, as you said, we're politely uh, pursuing that. You know, I think that was... <laughs> <laughs> now, let me, let me clarify that that was not the intention at all. The point is that this is, this is the time when we need to coordinate our efforts very, very closely. Uh, I think the coming days, uh, the challenges are not going to disappear. The challenges are going to be there. Uh, we are very happy that the Afghan National Security Forces, they have increased their capacity. They have, uh, we uh, witnessed um, firsthand the kind of uh, very promising role that the Afghan National Security Forces, they played during the, uh, uh, during the uh, uh, election, the recently ele uh, held elections. They were able to withstand the attacks which were being carried out by uh, Taliban or other elements. But the point is that this is the time that we, uh, we need to engage in some serious, discreet, and candid discussion. Uh, discreet and candid discussions, not through the media or through, because these are our common problem. As I mentioned, that uh, things are looking much better. Things are progressing. Uh, there is, uh, when I look at the, I mentioned three transitions which are taking place. The Indian transition, Pakistani transition, political transition, and Afghanistan tr uh, political transition. They are extremely important. Extremely important because these uh, political transitions will, can bring about, and the good interaction that we are going to have if, is something that is going to bring about a lot of uh, st stability. Um, uh, India-Pakistan improvement of relation would also bring about a lot of uh, 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 good stability in, in Afghanistan because that also over the years, and I, I'm, I'm not sort of uh, uh, revealing something which was a secret. This is something which is very well known to to all of us sitting here in this, uh, in this hall, that uh, it, it also became a kind of a, a point of contention between us and India. But my point is that things are developing in a very positive fashion, uh, rather than sort of accusing each other of uh, you know, us helping the Haqqani network or uh, the, I think we need to cooperate. And let, here I would also like to mention another one thing, that the 30 years of war in Afghanistan we need to understand has, apart from Afghanistan, has hurt Pakistan the most. Uh, we have, and again, I would like to mention that like everybody, uh, the United States of America, before that, the Soviet Union, we also made mistakes in the past. But the important thing is that the realization of those mistakes, and I think I have absolutely no doubt that the, uh, the, the, the current administration in Pakistan, we have we have taken, we have done a deep introspection about all these issues, whether 
Haqqani network, whether other jihadi organizations, and uh, whether we, as as you're not going to be supporting the Haqqani network, or you can be working with them we differently. Are, the operations that we are conducting, they are absolutely colorless. They are indiscriminate. Um, uh, 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 the important thing is that this is something that uh, we have. Uh, uh, we are getting the results. Uh, the and I think we, and, and and yet we, I've been told by both U.S. and Afghan officials that. They detected a movement they believe officially supported of Haqqani network leadership from Miram Shah and Mira Lee um, over the border into Afghanistan in advance of Pakistani military forces. Well, you see, the point is that uh, I think there is a contradiction here. Contradiction in the sense that um, on the one hand, we would Pakistan would want the ISAF U.S. forces to continue in Afghanistan, and on the other hand. If we sort of, uh, because why we want the continuation, why, why we support, why would we say that the abrupt withdrawal of the uh, NATO forces from Afghanistan uh, will not be good for the stability of Afghanistan or for the region? But, uh, but, but did you warn the Haqqani Network leadership that they needed to get out of the way, or did you tell them that they were not welcome? The operation that we were planning, they were being planned in from January this year. It was part of the discussion that were taking place in the media, in the parliament, as a matter of fact, in our interaction with the Afghan side and also the US side, we were very, very clear that we are going to launch these operations. This is something that was very well known. Of course, these people, they would have disappeared. Of course, these people, Haqqani Net people belonging to Haqqani Network, they would have left the area because this was something which was not a secret anymore that the operations would be launched. But the important thing is that North Waziristan is an area which was being termed as an area which provides safe haven to Haqqani network and also the, um, uh, the uh, terrorist elements from all over the world. From our point of view, the important thing is to reduce the capacity, to eliminate the capacity of all these forces who had made Waziristan, which was the most treacherous of the, uh, all, of the seven agencies that we have. I think we are moving in that direction. So rather than sort of uh, ju you know, prejudging the outcome of these operations and, uh, and uh, expressing these apprehensions, what is needed is basically a, a close interaction and cooperation between all three sides, US, Pakistan, NATO, <laughs> and ISAF forces, and Afghanistan, of course. So Jeff, do you have anything to add to that? Well, the ambassador and I have discussed this at length previously. Uh, we remain deeply concerned about the Haqqani threat against our, our, our forces and, frankly, the, the Afghan people um, in, in uh, the region of Afghanistan that, that borders uh, Miram Shah, Miram Lee, where the Haqqanis are based. There's been uh, quite tragic attacks of late uh, that mostly impacted the Afghan people, and, um, but we've suffered spectacular attacks as well. So we remain deeply concerned about the force protection risk uh, and the threat to the Afghan people. We've heard, uh, as the ambassador just reiterated, that it would be a colorless operation. We've heard from colorless operation, colorless operation that, that, that we've heard in Rawalpindi and Islamabad that it will not discriminate between good Taliban and bad Taliban. Um, and it was quite telegraphed and it's been, it's been on the books for quite some time. So putting aside that issue, uh, what matters now is how this operation uh, continues, and whether or not the Haqqanis are afforded a sanctuary to return to when the operation gets into its terminal phase. And that's what we're going to be watching. And that's what we've asked for, is that the Haqqanis, yes, they've been displaced, yes, they've, uh, they, they've been uh, disrupted, but that they not be allowed to regroup and resettle back into those historical areas, and, and that's what we're deeply concerned about. Got it. Um, so I did want to talk about the major threat in the area that drew the U.S. there, Al-Qaeda. Now, there are various different um, evaluations of their current health. How are they? Uh, are they flourishing in P2K, the um, eastern Afghanistan area where they had taken shelter? Uh, I, I always hear that they're at about 100, but that I've heard that in recent years and reported that in the past year or so, with the anticipated drawdown of U.S. forces, small numbers have started to move in. The U.S. has tried to counter that, mostly with predator and reaper drone strikes, because the area is too remote for the current 
number of forces that you have to reach. So health check on Al Qaeda, how are they doing? Look, the number is very difficult to, to stipulate. It's probably around 100 or so. Mm -hmm. Al Qaeda itself, while a problem, isn't the problem that you face operationally in Afghanistan. It is the facilitator network that supports Al Qaeda. Uh, we changed, uh, while I was the commander there, we changed our approach in many respects with, with targeting that network as well because they received Al Qaeda from across the border. Uh, they billeted them in remote areas of Kunar and Nuristan. Uh, they provided them the logistic support that they needed for mobility and sustainment and that sort of thing. And so while the Al-Qaeda presence was in fact a threat and a problem, it was the facilitation network that surrounded it and, and enabled it and abetted it, which was also the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we struck that network just as hard as we sought to strike the Al-Qaeda network as well. So the, my guess would be, and Jeff may or may not be able to comment on it, but the, the counterterrorism capability that will remain in the residual force will have to be, continue to be focused, not just on Al-Qaeda, but the uh, facilitation network that gives Al-Qaeda the maneuver space ultimately to be relevant. And remember, Al-Qaeda Al in the regional areas, whether it's in the federally administered tribal areas in Pakistan or in the P2K area of Afghanistan, it's less about their numbers than it is about their being able to plan. The planning cells and the activities and the command and control for the global network is what you want to disrupt. The numbers are not as important as ultimately the effects that they have. And so keeping them on the run, keeping them uprooted, uh, denying them a safe haven, wherever they may be on either side of the border, is really the effect. And so what you'll hear is the chatter from Al-Qaeda talking about it's too hot on the Pakistani side because of a variety of reasons, Pakistani operations, uh, drone operations, or they'll say it's too hot on the Afghan side, and they're comparing notes within the network on where they might go to find a cool spot. Mm. And it, it could even be in Yemen. It could even be in other places. And of course, uh, with the establishment of, of Daesh and the Caliphate, you know, we, we're beginning to find that there are platforms which can be even more valuable, ultimately, to create opportunity for Al-Qaeda to, to put down roots in important and potentially threatening ways. So with regard to uh, ultimately dealing with Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, it goes back to the ambassador's point. The cross-border coordination is important but it's, it's, it's only emblematic of the much bigger issue, which is that Afghanistan and Pakistan are two states in the same lifeboat. And they have to recognize this. And there has to be governmental cooperation, economic cooperation, which can be huge to the benefit of both countries, and it's, it's not taking off yet, and security cooperation. We've got to make sure we don't define the relationship too narrowly. There's got to be much more cooperation in that regard. And the tripartite commission, which exists today, a military commission, U.S., representing NATO, but it's generally the, the, the ISAF commander in Pakistan and Afghanistan, that tripartite commission with multiple layers for liaison and coordination, that needs to continue as a bilateral commission after the United States draws down and NATO draws down. But there's, that commission is where you'll find the opportunity to do all the coordination necessary for cross-border ops. And, and let me just make one comment about uh, Haqqani. Uh, when I was a commander there, Haqqani killed or wounded over 500 of my troops. And the operations in Waziristan somehow missed them every time they, uh, they conducted ops on the eastern side of the border. Nobody can doubt the fact that the Tariqi Taliban Pakistan, the TTP, are bad guys on either side of the border. It doesn't make any difference. We'll go after them. But as long as the Haqqani network has the ability to sidestep Pakistani military operations, and come back and reconstitute, we are not solving the problem. Haqqani is targeting the Kabul government. Haqqani is, a, is waging strategic warfare in its own way against Afghanistan. And it has to be treated as a threat to Afghanistan. And that's where the coordination and the, the close support of Pakistan in going after the Haqqani network is, is going to be very helpful strategically to Afghanistan's ability to maintain stability over time. It, they can't be permitted to sidestep as we say, the colorless operation has to be genuine, it has to be valid, and I applaud Jeff's uh, comments that the administration is going to watch that closely. And here's an opportunity, frankly. This colorless operation, if the Pakistani military pull this off in the manner that they are advertising they intend to, is a real opportunity for an improved relationship between the United States and Pakistan on this point. Now, you mentioned another tool of keeping the pressure on al-Qaeda, Taliban, the Haqqani network, 
drones. We've already discussed the kind of presence, that the follow-on presence you might have to keep to keep drones up and running in Afghanistan. You'd have to have a residual um, CIA and counterterrorism force to continue to gather the intelligence, coordinate with the Afghans, and target those individuals. On the Pakistan side, those are CIA drones, and that's always been an issue. Um, Jeff, will you all be able to keep flying those? Kimberly, I, uh, before, before I try to answer that, let me, I, I forgot to thank Clark um, and the, the Aspen <laughs> Security Forum. I Clark. Um, the forum is an excellent forum, as, as I've learned uh, over a couple uh, trips here and the last couple of days to discuss a great many things. Uh, operational CT matters are not one of those things. Um, so uh, what I will say is that we've made clear, uh, again, that we are going to continue this campaign against Al Qaeda senior leadership. Uh, and even beyond that, that we are going to maintain the capability and ensure we have the ability to disrupt threats, threats against the United States. Uh, with regard to Pakistan, I would say that, that, as the ambassador has discussed, this threat of militancy in the border region is a threat to us all. Uh, Pakistan has borne a very, very heavy cost uh, from this threat. They recognize that they have an internal militancy threat. It impacts Afghanistan, it, it impacts Pakistan, and it, of course, has impacted the United States. So what we continue to do is try to work in a cooperative way to find ways that we can address uh, all of those threats. Uh, and that's something that, that, as the ambassador has suggested, is, is uh, a source of discussion. And there's an opening uh, within Pakistan for a discussion of that kind of cooperative engagement. Now, there were some um, high-level meetings going on between top Pakistani um, officials and top US officials about building a new sort of counterterrorism framework. And I understand that the relationship now is a lot warmer than it was after the Osama bin Laden raid and the um, uh, incident with the CIA security officer, Raymond Davis. Um, can you all uh, enlighten us? Uh, are drone strikes still a problem? Um, or <laughs> is there an under, a mutual understanding? You know, I, um Kimberly, I think the uh, relationship um, have improved significantly. And uh, you know, when I took over as the foreign secretary two years ago, two two and a half years ago, uh, the relationship, uh, you know, we were, uh, you know, all that we were discussing with each other were complaints, counter complaints. But now, what we are discussing is a great cooperation on almost every issue. I think whether, whether it is counterterrorism cooperation, whether it is defense cooperation, whether it is economic cooperation. And there are very good stories to tell that, you know, we, the, the kind of uh, uh, the uh, area that we have covered uh, in the last two years. And I think the, uh, they are on an upward trajectory. Uh, you mentioned about the, uh, some of the recent visits which took place. Yes, we had some very important visits. And that is also, uh, the kind of the, the beauty of this relationship, because apart from the revival of the strategic dialogue process uh, that we revived uh, uh, in 2012, uh, we are engaged um, uh, at various levels. We had the, uh, now when I look at the whole issue, you know, the uh, issue of US-Pakistan uh, relations, we have good military-to-military uh, -military cooperation. Uh, we are coordinating very, very closely in terms of uh, for the pursuit of our common objectives, regional security issues. Today, there are more convergences uh, uh, than, than the issues between, between the two of us. Intelligence to intelligence cooperation is also wonderful. And as I also would like to mention that as we uh, have launched these operations, the success of these uh, operations, apart from the sacrifices which have been made by our own security forces, I think the, uh, the US help and assistance uh, with regard to the equipment that we were provided, the precision guide, uh, guided uh, uh, equipment, that, has, that was a game changer in the, in the tribal areas of Pakistan. That's something which is an, a, a good area of cooperation. And, uh, and, and, and can, can I just make the mm -hmm. point to the ambassador's comment? I, it's really important, I think, because it's often, it's often <laughs> lost in the noise associated with the complaints and counter complaints which have sadly defined the relationship uh, in the last several years. It's often lost on the public at large on the enormity of the commitment that Pakistan has made in the tribal regions and the sacrifices that they have made in the military. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an advocate for that because we did cooperate pretty significantly along the border on a number of issues. Now, we had 
profound differences on the targeting necessarily. But I think it's, for example, it's useful to know that uh, Pakistan's casualties, their killed in action in just the last three years exceed the killed in action of ISAF forces for the entire 13 years that we have been there. So th this has not been a casual undertaking by the Pakistanis on their side of the border. The strengthening of this cross-border coordination with, the, with ISAF and Afghanistan and Pakistan, and then later with Afghanistan and Pakistan, this is the key to solving this. It's ultimately the key to working very closely in terms of the, the shared common values, but also the shared common threat to take action necessarily to get after this thing. And, and often Pakistan does not get the credit it deserves for the, comp the, comp the, comp the uh, efforts that it has made. About the drones that you mentioned, I think the drones is certainly a very sensitive issue in Pakistan as it is uh, around the world. And I think it is also becoming an issue in the, even in the United States of America. But uh, see, the, apart from the um, uh, moral and legal issues, there are also issues related to human rights and also the uh, sovereignty uh, question of a country. Uh, this, our experience has been that this has certainly been counterproductive to our own efforts against, uh, against terrorism because you, we need to understand that when we carry out operations, and in the last three weeks we have been able to kill more than 500 of these militants in uh, Waziristan, there is, uh, we enjoy the support of the entire tribal region. We have the one million refuge, uh, IDPs who have come to the settled areas. They have nothing but words of praises, and also the entire Pakistani uh, nation is behind these operations. And, and yet when a drone strike hits nearby, one of your colleagues complained about it. And we need to understand that when the drones were suspended for six months, that uh, helped uh, improve the U.S. ranking in the eyes of Pakistani public by 13 points. You know, one of the, you know, apart from the fact that the government also uh, engaged in a positive narrative about uh, the U.S. Uh, help that it extended in various areas, counter uh, developing our capacity, developing in the energy sector and economic development, but also I think the, uh, the suspension of drones also had a, had, a, had a significant contribution in improving that. So, so Jeff, I, I know you're allergic to the word drone, but um, when we're talking about, could you refer to, might there be a, a future suspension of U.S. counterterrorism operations in the Fatah, the Pakistani tribal region? Well, again, I, I, I can't comment and I can't uh, forecast. But I, I, could, I can try to make you. I, uh, you can. Uh, <laughs> Which, which will only take time from uh, the audience being able to ask questions of the panel, uh, <laughs> which is an opportunity I don't think anyone wants to miss. Um, Switching that now. But Spoken like a true seal. <laughs> I, 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 I do think it's difficult I, I, to forecast. I think what we agree has to be the end state is addressal of the militant threat um, and, and elimination of al-Qaeda senior leadership and, and disruption of the threat to us all, I mean, because we have a common threat and we have a common interest in, in, in regards to taking on this militant problem. Okay. Maybe you guys can get it out of them. So we've got about a little <coughs> under 15 minutes left. Um, I'd like to start with um, Pam in the far table. And please um, state your name and where you're from. And stand up. Hello. Pamela Brown, Fox News. I have a question for Ambassador Jal Jalil Jalani. Uh, last year, last summer, August, uh, Fox News had a phone interview. I did a phone interview to uh, AQ Khan, Dr. AQ Khan. And at the time, I asked him if the Pakistani nukes were safe. And he assured me, quite safe, was the direct quote. Um, I just would like to extend that question now to you in terms of the security of the Pakistani nukes. Thank you very much for the panel. Thank you. You know, um, this uh, um, recently the uh, institute that publishes a report on the safety and uh, security of nuclear uh, the, the equipment, they have upgraded Pakistan's ranking. That's number one in response to your question. Secondly, um, uh, in recent months, Whenever any apprehension used to be expressed by members of the media, the White House or the State Department would also issue, the, issue a statement saying that we are extremely satisfied uh, with the kind of uh, uh, command and control system put in place by Pakistan to ensure the safety and security of Pakistan's nuclear material and equipment. And uh, I, again, I would uh, 
remind that uh, recently during the Hague Nuclear Security Summit, in one of the uh, press conferences, um, uh, one senior US official, he described the steps taken by, by Pakistan and Pakistan as a role model for other nuclear states in order to improve the, F, the security and safety of its nuclear equipment. Thank you. So next question. Um, uh, in the back, in the orange. Sorry, then I will take some questions from guys. <laughs> My name is Yasmin Kuli Fordham, and I'm from Intersections International, as well as an Aspen Security Forum scholar. UNDP has stated that 60% of Pakistanis are under the age of 25. Al Jazeera has reported that two-thirds of Afghanis are under the age of 25. What are your governments doing to deter terrorist recruitment in youth? What is the role of civil society, specifically NGOs, in deterring the recruitment of terrorists? And lastly, what opportunities for collaboration exist between your governments and NGOs in addressing the needs of the next generation of leaders? Thank okay, you. I have to say that um, that could be a panel, a great panel. Mm -hmm. but does anyone want to take a brief run at that? Well, I, I would say that you know it's a very pertinent question because it is uh, it it also relates to the extremism and. Uh, uh, that had set in, that had come to our part of the, uh, of the world. But the point is that this is a phenomenon which also has uh, a historical context as well. And also in the previous session, um, uh, uh, it, it has obviously external factors, obvious, and there are uh, uh, internal factors. But the important thing is that the, uh, we in Pakistan are certainly making uh, efforts to address this issue because this is an issue which has become of significant concern to us. This would requ also require um, uh, uh, monitoring the activities of madrissas. This would also require provision of quality education to your youth and also to provide skills. But the, I think at the same time, we also need to remember that when I say that this uh, problem that we have, this has an, a historical context because this was a problem of a certain period when we were all engaged uh, against Soviet Union. And a lot of money came, uh, 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 was spent in, in developing these, and, uh, raise, uh, uh, these uh, madrissas to impart this militant education. Now again, uh, it would require a lot of resources in order to reverse this trend. And whether it is Pakistan or whether it is Afghanistan, obviously we have limited capacity to, to address this issue. And if uh, a collective effort was made in creating this phenomenon, a monster, a collective effort would also be required in reversing this trend. Work in progress. Um, sir. Thank you. Um, my name, is Gopal. Yeah. Uh, my name is Gopal Ratnam. I'm a reporter with Bloomberg News. Question for Ambassador Jilani. Two questions, in fact. On uh, the operation in North Waziristan, um, you talk about having killed 500 militants. Can you talk a little bit about what your government is doing in terms of cutting off the ideological institutional support to the militant groups that have operated in that region for a while? And the second question, I mean, there was a Pakistani official in Washington a couple of weeks ago who spoke about keeping Pakistani troops in the region beyond 2016, maybe 150,000 troops stationed in the region. And does Pakistan intend to seek US financial assistance beyond 2016 as part of the coalition support funds to station the, keep the troops there to prevent the return of some of these militants back from uh, on the other side of the border? Thank you. You know, I'll respond to your second question first. But the, the, as we see it, the situation as it looks like, as the, uh, 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 the drawdown comes to, you know, the date comes closer, probably additional responsibilities would come on our shoulders. As it is, we have increased the number of Pakistani troops on the border from the previous 145 to 175 now. Uh, for us, it's a surge. For us, for uh, the U.S. and uh, NATO and ISAF forces, it's a drawdown. And obviously, uh, in the uh, foreseeable future, 
uh, while efforts would be made, uh, I, one hopes that uh, the political transition in Afghanistan will, uh, will uh, complete to the satisfaction of everybody in Afghanistan. Uh, we hope that there will be an inclusive government that itself will have a very positive impact on the security situation. But God, God forbid, in case the situation does not move forward in the direction that we are all hoping that it would move forward, then obviously uh, we, will, we will have to maintain a large num number of troops' presence on the border for many reasons. For instance, in, uh, in, in Waziristan, we have moved in about 40 to 50,000 troops. And these troops, after clearing the area, they will be, uh, they will be uh, uh, present there. They will be uh, uh, the rehabilitation of the uh, IDPs. That would be the next step that we, uh, we plan to take. Uh, and also to ensure that these people, they do not come back and regroup. Uh, we already had a tribal jirga, which uh, on their own volition, they came and met the president of Pakistan, saying that this is the best thing that has happened and that they need to be empowered to ensure that, uh, that, uh, uh, that these people, they do not come back. So obviously, that would require additional resources on the part of uh, Pakistan, and this is something that we are discussing with the U.S. side on a, on a, on a regular basis. So I, with, I have, I have so, to interrupt because we're, we're kind of running out of time. Sure. Um, but Ambassador Hakimi, listening to this description of this campaign, does it give you hope that you, you can work together on this militant problem, even though you don't seem to see eye to eye on which groups are the enemy? Well, uh, uh, we as a diplomat, we always want to uh, make the situation very rosy and everything is, works out very well and be optimistic. That's a part of our job. Mm. But uh, uh, and this is something that we have been doing, at least for, for quite some time. Uh, with our uh, uh, Pakistani brothers. Uh, Making not things only seem rosy, new, but it's not? Well, with, not with this administration, with the previous administration, and not only bilaterally. We, as uh, General said, we had this uh, mechanism to work with ISAF, NATO, and also trilaterally. And we had another trilateral mechanism to work it out up to now. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and as General said, we, we should have bilateral relationship, not only security, but economic cooperation, which, which is happening now. And we are hopeful for that to happen. But I'm glad that uh, uh, Ambassador just mentioned before that the new, uh, new administration now, they have taken a new approach. And, and this is what uh, Jeff also hopeful that is going to happen. And we have been hearing that. But we are, uh, since we have, uh, we have the past experience, uh, this time we will, be, uh, 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 we will be cautiously optimistic. And unless we will see something uh, some practical steps on the ground, then of course we are, we are willing, this is our policy, to be uh, engaged uh, bilaterally and also through uh, other multilateral mechanism. And, uh, and we will remain hopeful. I think that's, that's good for the people of both country. And there is no other way uh, other than uh, we, should, we should, as Ambassador said, genuinely and also honestly, we should address this issue. And, and we should uh, eliminate that policy to use uh, militancy and also insurgency as a foreign policy to, uh, to use that elsewhere. On both and, sides? And on, on both sides. On both sides. At least from our side, we have said that uh, publicly. And, and, and yet I've, I've all, heard from both of your intelligence services that you all run proxies against each other. Well, but there is a difference. We say that the, with the support of our... Uh, NATO allies. If we have intelligence, we receive intelligence from Pakistani uh, uh, brothers, we will take the lead and we will eliminate them. And we publicly say that they are not welcome to use our soil against our neighbor. We say that publicly. And we are willing to hear the same thing from our brothers, to say that pa Taliban and those that they are creating problem for us and they are a threat to, to use you also, that they shouldn't be welcome in Pakistan and use whether Quetta or other cities in Pakistan against us. So to sum up the panel, um, you two disagree on drones and CT, but you're talking. You two disagree on how each other is handling enemies and which is the enemy and the pace of that. And General Allen, you're hopeful that possibly a, a larger force will stay a little bit longer 
um, if security doesn't look good in Afghanistan in 2016. I hope that conversation can occur if it's mm -hmm. necessary. That's the important thing. And yet you're all up here having this conversation in public, for which I thank you and um, thank all of you for your questions. Thank you.